What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got Jeff Baluda, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. How you doing today? Very well, thank you very much. Yeah, we're, we're in Miami, and uh, what else can be better? <laughs> right, beautiful, sunny Miami. You can't really beat that. And, and we're going to talk about the different elements, the different flavors of the different communities you're a part of. But let's mm-hmm. go back a little bit. I, I'd love to hear about the farm growing up in France. Can, can you take us back there? I'd love to know what a young chef's like. Well, um, when I was growing up in the farm, I didn't know I was going to be a chef. But I knew that I love food and I love the rhythm of the season where you really, there was not a single week where there weren't something coming out of the ground, coming out of the tree, coming out of the bushes that you just take pride to pick and pride to eat. And also my father was doing a farmer's market every week in Lyon, the town. So we were living about 45 minutes outside of Lyon. And uh, we were doing everything on this farm. We were doing, of course, a lot of vegetables, but uh, we had a lot of chicken, so we were selling eggs. We were also selling the chicken. We were selling duck, we were selling squab, rabbit, baby goats. We had goats, so we were selling cheese, so we were making a lot of goat cheese. Uh, We had cows as well. Uh, milk and uh, so everything was from the farm and um, and I think this was really for me uh, a sense of this sense of pride for something so humble and simple as an ingredient but uh, how well we were sort of growing this stuff and how proud we were to sell it and we didn't care to be the cheapest on the market. We just wanted to make sure we had our regulars coming because they trust us in uh, the quality of the food we were making for, for them. And, and I think uh, beside that, the farm had this you know, life cycle. Uh, you know, when you have life as animals, uh, there is not too much vacation. Yeah. They don't give you vacation. <laughs> it's not like you can take them with you. <laughs> And I, I want to know about that. So does this come from, a, from just those fresh ingredients, the feeling, the touching, the being a part of that, that, that you get to see them grow and develop and then come onto the plate at the end of the evening? Is that where that first love came from? Certainly, because um, I was helping my parents for in any task I could do, which was helpful to them. And we were five children, and uh, I had two sisters older and two younger brothers. And I was certainly the oldest, brother, the oldest boy, so I was kind of in charge of a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, driving the tractors and, uh, and milking the cow at night after school. And, and, and also, you know, as a kid, it's fun to be able to grab a bucket of, you know, five gallon of milk and uh, try to carry it and, and try to not dump it in the, in the wrong place. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and also, I always felt that there was entertainment within the, the rhythm of the farm. There was never a, a dull moment. And, um, and, and I think uh, my grandmother was in charge of cooking for the whole family. And so she will, beside making the goat cheese and having certain tasks to do, she was also in charge of the meals and everyone could help her but I love to stay in the kitchen and help her as well. And I think that always, without saying that my, I became a chef because of my grandmother's cooking, but my grandmother definitely gave me a sense of, uh, of passion around food, I would say. So, so what, talk about that passion. I, I'd love to hear, what age did you start to realize that, you know what, you loved being in that kitchen more than other people? Um, I was about 10, 11, 12. And uh, by the time I was 14, I decided that I wanted to be a cook. And I heard that there was a cooking school nearby where I was, so I could go. And uh, that would have been a compatible school with, uh, with um, it would have been like maybe eight grades, nine grades, um, uh, where uh, I could start cooking. And I went there for about three weeks, four weeks, a month. 
And I told my parents, and I said, no, I don't want to go to that school. I mean, the food is worse than at home, and, and I'm not going to learn anything good there. I don't know. I had a sense that, you know, good food didn't have to be fancy, but it had to be good. And, um, Were you always like that? Uh, um, not afraid to speak your opinion? <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. <laughs> and, and from that, um, I was very lucky. And I think in life, you know, how do you succeed? How do you make it? I think what's important is to also have a little bit of luck, meaning like sometimes you need a little bit of a push from someone, a little bit of a help, a little bit of a, a connection. And... Uh, Part of uh, some of our local clients, uh, of my parents, and who became friends of the family, uh, was a Contessa, and a Contessa di Volpi. She was a, an Italian Contessa who was really grand, and uh, I always joke because she was driving a 1969, 1970, she was driving a comfortable Mustang with a white poodle next to her. She had white gray hair, smoking all day long and drinking whiskey. And, but she was a, a lady who lived and who lived so much that you know, she had um, a dozen of horses where they were racing in the track. She was going gambling in the casino, but she, also, she was also going out to the best restaurant in town all the time. And every chef and restaurateur worship her and she, they respect her and worship her and really listen to her. And so one day my parents told, told her and said, you know, Danielle don't want to stay in this school and I don't know what we're gonna do. We don't know where to start because my parents weren't going to fancy restaurants. Uh, we don't know where he should go and cook because he want to be a, a cook and not a chef even. I didn't even know what a chef mean, uh, but uh, and then uh, she said, well, I'm going to take care of it. And she knocked, I mean, she went to every of the two star and the three star in Lyon around. And she made sure that she found me a job somewhere. And she found me a job in a restaurant called Nandron in Lyon. And that was a two star restaurant. That was one of the best restaurants in Lyon for this kind of uh, apprenticeship and where I was going to go to school two days a week and work six days a week the rest of the time. You know, 12 hours a day. Yeah. I, six days a week at 14, that was not, uh, it was not, uh, you know, child labor, but uh, <laughs> it was definitely something like that. They were putting you to work, it sounds like. Very much. But what I want to know is, is why was the, why was she willing and to knock on all these doors for you? What, what were you doing at that time? You, you must have been. I was, I was very close to her because I was the one who was grabbing my back and bringing her cheese and eggs and, and vegetable. And, and, and when she had nobody to stay home with her, uh, when they were like, um, you know, uh, there was time, she always wanted to make sure that she had someone next to her uh, in case something happened or, you know, for security. And so uh, sometimes she would ask me, okay, Danielle, you know, you stay with me in my home. So, and, and she has always been, you know, she was the one who bought me my first gold watch when I was 12 and all that. So she loved the family. And so uh, being, and always very generous with every one of us. And so she felt almost like, um, if there is one thing I can help is that department. I know a lot about food. I go out all the time and I can definitely talk to those chefs. Something it seems like is coming up already is just this overall thread of quality where from, from the ingredients on the farm to the quality of the, the other chefs around you that can help you learn. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and so for my first week when I started to work, I already bumped into Paul Bocuse, the greatest chef in the world. And because my, uh, my new boss uh, was the best friend of Paul Bocuse, and Paul Bocuse will come to the market, and the market was next door to the restaurant where I was working. He will come to the market, and after the market, he will come and have a coffee in the restaurant where I was working. And for me, my first job was to go in the market behind my bus and picking up all the crates of vegetables and, and fish and meat and whatever he was buying, and carrying it to, back to the restaurant. Uh, so, of course, I was 
in this now I was in this community of chef, but it was almost like a, a club in Lyon where all the great chefs were meeting every morning in the market. They were doing their own market because nobody will deliver to you. You had to go and pick it up at the, at the, at the market. And uh, they will do their ordering and all that. Then they will all meet together. Uh, they will all drink and eat. And then after they all split and go to their places. And for me at 14, to see those greatest chefs of Lyon and Paul Bocuse being the leader there, um, I, was, I was taken by, I mean, I say, well, I'm, I'm so lucky I'm in the right place. At, at that point, hard work was not an issue. You know, it was, I had to become a good cook in order to become a great chef. And so I made sure that I did that. And uh, does not mean that, you know, I didn't get in trouble, you know, between the age of 14 and 17, you can get in big troubles. I can imagine a, a little, kid, a little living, espresso, a few bottles of wine in the morning. <laughs> living by yourself in the big city like that. <laughs> But, um, and then um, uh, I was also, the restaurant I was working for was doing the, catering to the town hall and to the state hall. There was two, the state hall and the town hall was in the same uh, city. And uh, at the state hall, I was included into the team who had to cook for the president of France. So at the and age this of... this is 14 to 7, somewhere like uh, Yeah, that. at the age of 15, I was already cooking for the president of France. Not only myself, but I was part of the team. And, and so these kind of things like make you kind of like dream about where am I going? What is going on? <laughs> so what, what, you're, you're 15, you're cooking for... They, they had to give me a pass with the blue, white, red and the stamp and the, uh, that official pass to go through the gate and all that. You know, just like when you cook for a president, you have to be clear. <laughs> And so that, uh, and, and then many other happen, uh, many other things happen after that where I, 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 I could see it and I was entering sort of the highest rank of the chef world. Uh, and there was many other apprentices in town who was going to school with me and they, They were working in bistro or smaller restaurants, or, and, and they were very good cook as well, but maybe they didn't have access to that sort of high-end restaurants like two-star or three-star Michelin restaurants. So you were aware of just the magnitude and importance of the people who were around you at that time and what you were doing, right? Of course, and also in the restaurant, I was interested by everything. So I was interested by the wine, the service, the, you know, every department in the restaurant was for me, uh, the decor, the, uh, the detail in the restaurants. And, uh, and I will love at the end of service before going home, asking questions about wine to the waiters and maybe get a little sip of this and a little sip of that. <laughs> <laughs> and and so you know it's like you you it was such a far world from where i came from but i could connect to everything very well and i think that i think made me a uh, a good cook i had a good sense of uh what was excellence and even if i never lived in you know a fancy world with uh fine dining and i didn't know what truffle was And I didn't know what foie gras was and because I was not in the region of foie gras. And, uh, but I knew a lot of other things who kind of like didn't make me so naive, you know? The word that comes to mind seems to be curiosity. Were you just an unbelievably curious kid? Curiosity and passion to learn, I will say. It's funny, we were talking uh, with Michael, who's worked with you for, I think he was saying, 22 years now. And I'm just, just asking him some questions. And he said, no, 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 chef is always thinking about the future. He wants to get better. Every meal he cooks, he wants it to be his best. <laughs> and it, it seems like this was ingrained in you from an early age. Very much. And also, when I entered this restaurant, I, I was part of a, a club, in a way, which was uh, the Relais Chateau. 
and also the Les Grandes Tables du Monde. And those two associations are made of the finest restaurateur and hotelier in the world and very boutique, very small, but uh, they have to... Uh, They have to have a two-star Michelin or three-star Michelin for the Grand Table du Monde, for example, which was made only of chef restaurateur. And um, that book, you know, as you flip the page, you can see the different restaurants all over France. And that starts to make you dream about traveling. And one thing I've learned when I was very young as a chef is that I choose a wonderful profession and it don't matter where I am in the world, I will always be able to practice. And uh, you know, you don't need a license anywhere to practice your profession, but also you can choose anywhere in the world to travel and discover the world through cooking. And uh, that I felt like uh, very uh, interested by that. So I did my Tour de France. So after Lyon, I went to Burgundy. I spent two years in Burgundy in a Swiss style restaurant called La Mer Blanc. Then after I wanted to go because a, a restaurant in Provence just had Swiss style Michelin. So I, I wanted to start there. So it was the Moulin de Mougin in south of France, in Cannes, near, uh, Mougin near, next to Cannes. And there was Chef Roger Verger, an amazing, great chef also. And then after from there, he sent me to Denmark And I lived in Copenhagen for a year and a half and working for Roger Verger because he was a consultant there and discovered Denmark. So that was my first trip now out of France from my trip out of Lyon. Now I'm, fly, I'm going out of France and I'm 19 about. And, uh, and I lived in Denmark for a year and a half. Then I felt I was too young to be... Uh, a sous chef, meaning like a chef with a lot of a young chef with a lot of responsibility, and so I wanted to do another three star. I felt it was important for my background to keep learning with a great chef. So I, I want to hear you talk about that though, because you could have let your ego get in the way and say, "Nope, I'm ready. I'm ready to be a sous chef." How yeah. were you? How did you understand the importance of learning more at that time? Because I felt that. Um, Denmark was fantastic. Uh, Copenhagen was amazing. There was already a start of a wonderful local chef growing there. But um, I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more than just what I've experienced. And I think for my resume, it was important to have another three star experience in it. And uh, I had to do it before I was 25, for sure. And so I did it. Uh, at the time, I was 27, 28. And uh, so I went back to France and did another full year at a restaurant called Michel Guérard. Uh, and that's a three star in the southwest of France. So now I'm in, in the southwest from Provence. I go to the opposite side near the Pays Basque and all that. Uh, and, um, and then after a year there, I was in love with a Danish girl. So. You know, I don't know if that wasn't the job really would pull me there. I, it was more of a girlfriend. So I went back to Denmark. We've, we've all been guilty of this. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, uh, so back to Denmark and back to the same hotel I was working, the Hotel Plaza at the time, next to Tivoli. Have you ever been to Copenhagen? So Tivoli is that fantastic um, garden where it's uh, basically a fantasy Uh, garden where there's uh, theaters and there's play and there's also uh, amusement park for adult and children together. Uh, often amusement park are made for children only, but this one is it has both, which is I think very very classy. Only open in the summer as well, and uh, it was next to the hotel I was working, so it was fun to be in Copenhagen, but good to be back also. And uh, the girlfriend didn't last too long, but. Uh, then I moved and became the chef at a young Danish chef who was very, his father was already a restaurateur, but he wanted to break off from his father and really start something uh, of his own and something a little more edgy, something a little more hip. And so his name was Jan Urtikal. And so I was his first chef for a year uh, at his new restaurant uh, in Copenhagen. And uh, that was fantastic. And 
uh, I really loved my time in Copenhagen at that time. Maybe. Do you have a story from there? I saw your eyes light up. You, uh, you, you could see the memories coming coming through. Oh, very much. And uh, the the thing is that I was coming from a structure of a big kitchen, and also all those three star restaurant was was big brigade, and and the hotel also where we were like maybe thirty cooks inside, and I go and open this restaurant where it was him Janu Hotikal which he was a chef restaurateur but not always in the kitchen I was his chef de cuisine and then we had two other cooks or three with me and uh, you know we were uh, doing everything and I really enjoyed that moment where it was you know the fact that there was a very small structure and you get involved with everything and uh, the restaurant is not too big and uh, it's really this sense of family in the place and uh, very artistic, you know, uh, offbeat a little bit, uh, the restaurant, so it was cool. So you said artistic, almost offbeat. Do you think that's where you developed kind of your own flair for things? No, but I did develop more creativity there, more sense of freedom and independence because also I was, you know, that was really the time where uh, I had real good exchange with a, with a chef owner and we could really be creative together and and do a lot of things together versus before i was maybe more apt to do the cooking of the chef i was working for uh, rather than here we were starting with a with a blank slate and we just had to put everything on it so it's almost like when you have someone who's talented giving them a little leeway to let them develop completely their and and also when it was, it was the first time that I was going into the creation of a new restaurant and the opening of a new restaurant. And that uh, there's a process to it. There's a process of creativity. There's a process of uh, research and development. And, and also, you know, you, you choose everything together. You, uh, not only the menu, but the silverware, the tablecloths, the, the feel. And I think to me, that gave me a sense one day if I opened my own restaurant, I already, I, I, I got my first class on, <laughs> you know, how to get prepared to open a restaurant. I would love hearing what goes through your head. When, when does that idea happen about you opening a new restaurant, the, the, the current day? <laughs> what is that like? So the current day, uh, it took me a while, you know, after that mark, I came to America. And now we're, we're going to talk about coming all the way absolutely. over here. And, and uh, it took me a decade to be able to open my first restaurant because I came to America. I had no name. I had no money. Uh, I had, yes, I had talent, I guess. That took me where I am today, but um, I had the confidence that if I stay here, I got to succeed or, you know, go home. <laughs> where was that confidence developed? I don't know, through the fact that uh, I think my confidence in wanting to open a restaurant in America was through the youth working with me and all these young chefs with me, working with me, giving me the confidence that we can push any walls, we can climb any mountains here, <laughs> we can, you know, we can, we can make it together. And I think uh, today, still today, uh, I am always driven by my team, by the people working with me, around me, will give me the chance to, you know, push. Uh, it's, it's not always a dream, it's also sometimes uh, uh, you know, when you when you create a new business, it it's uh, it's a long period sometime before you get there, and uh, and it's uh, and there's you know high and low all along the way, uh, because you know you dream big and you kind of like uh, have to come down and fit the whole thing into the box because uh, everything is costly or everything is not always possible or always not logical. Or, and, um, and I think uh, my first restaurant, uh, I am I'm a micromanager by uh, default. So it's, it's, it's a, it's maybe, maybe it's a plus, but I think to me sometime I have a hard time let it go. 
and it don't matter if it's home or if it's uh, at work. And so, of course, I want to get involved with everything, including knowing where the plumbing is passing in the restaurant, how they are placing the electrical. You know, I like to know what's behind the wall before they cover that wall. So in case there is a leak, in case there is a problem, I, I like to know where the, maybe the problem could come from. So I am in my space, I'm opening my new restaurant and I'm like coming every day and taking pictures of every, uh, every uh, sort of like, uh, you know, where they put the plumbing uh, on the floor, where they, where they, before they cover the walls and I make sure that I take the picture of everything. And, uh, and I feel like more informed and aware to answer any question to anyone. I know how to read the blueprints very well. I know how to read, uh, uh, I, I know how to talk with engineer and uh, not that I have any education about engineering, but I think I have a sense of- uh, Self-taught now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's and I love that also. Yeah, the, the details. And I think that's what creates an unbelievable experience for someone coming in and, and understanding the space creates that element along with the food. It's, it's all part of that experience. W was there a chef you worked with that you first saw them take that, that just that process and just the attention to detail or was this something you've just always had? Well, no, I, uh, since I started to be uh, a chef, I always observe my mentor very carefully and also the, the leading people carefully in their organization, in their thought process, in their, um, uh, and also in their personal life, you know, their passion for arts, their passion for cars, their passion for, uh, for, for details who uh, might not be obvious to anyone, but matter a lot to him. And uh, when you start to understand the thought process of someone, I think you learn a lot from it. You've mentioned this before, and I know it's in your books, about the mentors, about working in a great restaurant, because what you can learn from those people, is that what you always looked for? Something that was going to challenge you and, and push what you were capable of? Of course, and that's what I think made me the chef I am today, without being surrounded not only by a, a great mentor, but by also a great team around that mentor, who has gave so much, and everyone brings something and i think that's the that's the the beauty of working in a in a in a good brand in a good house where there's uh discipline and there's uh you know an ethic for the 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 craft that is unique and uh unique to itself uh, the the individual but you know every time you work for someone else you discover a new uh, ethic in a way and a different expression of his passion, different um, expression of, you know, the way the person move in the kitchen, the way the person talk in the kitchen, the way the person feel in his kitchen. It's very different. Every chef has, uh, you know, his own little... Um, um, sort of uh, inside uh, almost tendencies that they have yes. just to, to not do only own. tendency but uh, you know uh, I would say that no chef is really equal but at the same time we all think the same way and yet we're no equal so uh, every chef has something of his own who define and characterize the type of chef you are. So when you're thinking about new restaurants, what are you looking for in a young chef? Are, are there little things that you're looking for that they have? Yeah, of course. I mean, we're always looking. Uh, what's important, I think, is for a chef to understand the restaurant is working with and what are the expectations, not only of me, but of, for example, the partners we have sometime outside of New York, we are partner with hotels, but also the expect expectation of the customer, but, you know, and how to express the cooking I want to do 
in the best way possible that it don't feel pretentious, it don't feel, you know, um, unconnected with the space and, and the, the place. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of things matter in, the, in, in a restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, bon, I mean, the food is the most important thing, it's true, but also the ambiance, the service, the price, the, 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 the feel of the place, the, um, uh, the location of the place. Is it in the tropics? Is it in the, you know, in a Nordic town? Is it, uh, so I think um, all this, because at the end we're in the entertainment business, uh, just like you go and buy a, a ticket to go and listen to someone singing or, or, or acting, uh, I think we are cooking and, 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 and entertaining you for a couple of hours. So I think it's very important that that play is coherent. And I think that's the hardest part to achieve is this coherence. So people feel, oh, let's go back and have it again. Absolutely. I mean, I'm even thinking when my wife and I, when we go out and have a great meal, it's more about just the food. It's the experience we have where we want to have yeah. that and relive that again. You were starting to talk a little while and ago. And sometimes, you know, it's about also the comforting part of it where, you know, there's restaurant where they know how to leave you alone. And because it's, you know, it's Sunday night and you just want to go out and it's not about anything but being with you and your wife or you and your and, and 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 whoever you want to go out with but being left alone and, and just have dinner and go home and and so you know sometimes it's uh, that balance of knowing reading your customer is very important and knowing who you are dealing with and uh it's i think part of this f experience in a restaurant is to really um never uh always uh, of course have standard but never standardize everything to the customer you know what i mean i absolutely love that yeah that's, that's, it's an unbelievable framework to work off of yeah i love that <laughs> you were starting to talk a little while ago about coming to america and coming to the states did you view that as a risk or i mean that must have not been easy to do no uh, i view that as freedom in a way of you know I'm a 25-year-old chef, and someone want to go, uh, want me to go to Washington D.C. and cook in their residence. They're gonna give me a visa. They're gonna give me a car. They're gonna give me an apartment. They're gonna give me a very lousy salary, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to America, <laughs> and and for me it was part of like I'm young enough to try. I knew so much about what was happening in America because a lot of friends of mine had work and the chef I worked with, Michel Guérard, was at a restaurant in New York called uh, at Regine. It was a nightclub where in the early part of the night it was a restaurant, then it turned into a nightclub. And, um, and also the great chef from Paul Bocuse to Roger Verger to Michel Guérard and George Brown, they were all coming to America and go to uh, Robert Mondavi, because Robert Mondavi at the time was this young pioneer in Napa Valley who was starting his winery in the 60s or somewhere around there. And, and he decided uh, to bring the greatest chef of France to his winery and do cooking class for a dozen of people and have beautiful lunch and, and just entertain them and fly them there. So, you know, chefs, they like to, where, wherever they can go for free and have a good time, they're, they're all in. <laughs> so what, so what, was, what was the idea when you first get there? What, what did you think was going to happen? What were you hoping to happen? So I knew, I knew enough information on, on uh, what was happening already in America. And there was starting to be a shift of generation where there were a lot of French chefs who came, but they were kind of like, with the past, with the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And uh, there was this new generation of chefs starting up from Jeremy Tower in San Francisco to Wolfgang Puck in uh, LA to uh, Alice, Wat Alice Water and, and, uh, 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 and chef also in New York, um, 
who was uh, starting to American chef as well and, and young French chef. So I felt it was a good time. And I arrived in Washington, D.C. in 1980, and the chef I knew was Jean-Louis Paladin. Uh, and right away, I, I met with Jean-Louis and his team there, and then I met with the chef of the French embassy, uh, a young French chef as well, and then I started to meet an American chef there. And um, I felt very interested by the dining scene there. What do you mean you felt interested by that dining scene? Was, this, was it a, a completely different feel from France and where you'd been prior? No, but I could see that uh, talent was appreciated and talent was uh, really um, uh, supported as well, very much by the media, by the customer, by the community. And uh, I, I, I looked at many different restaurants. So for example, there was Restaurant Jean-Louis, which was an avant-gardiste. He was a young chef who was doing tasting menu only, so 25 seat restaurants. And uh, he will write his menu every day by hand based on what he found on the market and having an amazing wine cellar. And that was to me like, wow, if he can do that here, then you know, that means there is um, a good potential to, to, to become as good as the French three-star restaurants in France, I would say. And that's what he was aiming for. And uh, Patrick O'Connell, who started the Inn at Little Washington in uh, the late 70s, and I met Patrick when I arrived in Washington, and there's this young American chef who has this incredible little place, an hour and a half maybe outside of Washington, and people will drive to go and eat there already. And so, and, and then there were restaurants like Jean-Pierre, or, uh, uh, and, and Restaurant Jean-Pierre was the classic French restaurant who was kind of more old-fashioned type of restaurant, uh, where you could get a great salmonier, but uh, not, uh, some dish who was very creative or uh, more on the classic French. And, and I felt like, you know, there is a world who like both. They like the creativity, the novelty, the, the, the startup uh, of a business, but they also love the established old place. And I felt good about that because I knew good about my classic French cuisine, but I also was, I, I worked with chefs who were very creative. And uh, after two years in DC, I, as a private chef, I had enough with it. Uh, I wanted to go to New York because I really felt New York City was the city to stop before I was gonna go back to France. And uh, I started in a hotel there, very good hotel, and did, um, and that was the Westbury Hotel, the Polo Lounge, and I was a sous chef there for about, I would say, uh, nine months, a year. And then after I opened the Plaza Atene Hotel in New York, which the Plaza Atene was the famous Plaza Atene Paris, opening a branch in New York. And I was the chef de cuisine in the biggest palace in France, uh, you know, the sister of the biggest palace in France, in New York City. What, what was that like when you got that? Did you understand the importance of that? Yes, but at the same time in New York, I felt, well, I'm lucky I'm opening a restaurant in one of the greatest hotel. Uh, it's unique, it's a great experience, but it's not personal enough for me. And You, you want to go higher. I wanted to go higher. I wanted to work in a restaurant and not just in a hotel with the restaurants. And so I moved around the block to Le Cirque and I became the chef at Le Cirque. And uh, I was the first young French chef to enter this old established restaurant. When I talk about Restaurant Jean-Pierre in DC being old and classic, Le Cirque was very much the same in New York. And I was there to change everything and, 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 and without destroying everything, but change a lot of things, even in the classic dishes, I wanted to make sure that they were done even better or my way and, and, uh, and, and make it even grander. And uh, I did that for six years and I brought the best accolade one restaurant could ever imagine in America by being one of the greatest restaurants in America as uh, the chef there. And also I won the James Beard, 
uh, best chef in New York. I won uh, best uh, best new chef with food and wine and many other accolades like this. And I worked very hard because it was a very busy place and it was a very demanding place with a clientele who was maybe the most powerful and the most demanding and yet the most loyal and faithful clientele I've ever seen. And so, uh, uh, you know, you had, uh, at the time that was the Reagan, so you had Nancy Reagan, Barbara Walters, and, and uh, Iv uh, Ivanka, no, not Ivanka, <laughs> Ivana Trump, and all these ladies, ladies who lunch was coming there. But then next to it, you had like Ronald Perlman, and you had uh, um, all the big tycoon of New York eating there as well. And the owner, Sergio Maccioni, was the master in, in the front of the house. And I think I learned a lot through him about how to succeed in a restaurant when you are a chef and how to understand also the front of the house part, uh, which is very important. Can, can you explain that? Something you learned about front <laughs> well, of house from him? Yeah, I think... Uh, uh, Sergio Maccioni was uh, a master in uh, setting the tables and, and, and having and knowing where to place people. And with this power game of, uh, of New York at the time where the power lunch and power dinner were very, very, uh, everybody had ego and you have to be able to manage those ego without letting them know that you really worked hard at trying to find which table they will be best placed because this guy just divorced and his wife, his, 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 his ex-wife is coming and he's coming and if you happen to put them in the same place, in the same tables, that's a disaster. So, you know, how do you keep things apart from, you know, how do you split uh, Mrs. Estee Lauder with Ronald Perlman who owned Revlon with Mrs. Estee Lauder who owned Lauder? How do you keep them as away from each other? It's not just food anymore, is it? No, it's, it's really the power of setting people on. And, and there's, you know, the king of Spain coming and there's this and there's that. I mean, it's just like every day was just a, uh, Andy Warhol was hanging out there all the time. And uh, so they were celebrating Michael Douglas with his father, Kirk, and with his son. They will, the three Douglas will be coming together. Uh, and, and, and you could feel and sense the energy in the restaurants. Uh, it was incredible and to be the chef there and to go in the dining room and take the orders of the King of Spain or the Michael Douglas. I mean, for me, it was very exciting and you'll do anything for those people. If he say, you know, I just uh, one time uh, we had a customer who was always eating baked potatoes and I say, oh God, those baked potatoes are so boring. And <laughs> I'm going to go to him and ask him if he liked truffle. So I went and asked him if he, and this is a big, big tycoon. So I asked him, do you like, uh, do you like truffle? And he said, oh yeah, I love truffle. White truffle, I love white truffle, I love black truffle. I said, okay. And I, I made uh, uh, the baked potatoes. I, I took, the, bake, uh, I, I took the, 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 sh the flesh of the potatoes out. I crushed it off with them. Um, uh, truffle butters and, 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 and grated a lot of white truffle inside, put the whole thing back into the potatoes and then warm it up and then cover it with slivers of truffle, like a mountain of slivers of truffle on top. And I present him that and charge him for about 120 bucks for the baked potatoes and he loved it. <laughs> so it was never about the price, it was always about the, 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 the I think the, the, the the ecstatic uh, pleasure of food. A, a bit of a surprise almost each time you're not knowing. Was that the most fun you've ever had in your career? I, I'm just seeing you well, light up Well, I don't up know right about now. fun, but uh, I, that's, the, that's a time where I worked very hard because I had to manage a kitchen and, uh, you know, I, uh, I made well for the owner that, uh, you know, he, he, he was a very profitable place, but also, you know, you need, uh, you need, plenty of cooks to do that in the kitchen. And uh, I think I had plenty of cooks at the time. I had access to all the ingredients I wanted. Uh, that was very important for me. And I was able to make change, make change in an established place and, and create dishes who still today 
uh, I would say, uh, 36 year later uh, or 34 years later, I created dishes such as the popiette wrapped in crispy potatoes, the sea bass wrapped in crispy potatoes with on the bed of leeks with a red wine sauce. That dish still at Cafe Boulou in New York, uh, 36 years later, and, and, and still the most popular dish on the menu. And, and uh, so to me, I've created amazing classic dishes there who has been, uh, which we still take pleasure at redoing. So in a way, it's not all about, it's about creativity because when you create a new classic, you have to think about creativity and technique and uh, consistency and how you're going to be able to do it over and over. But then after, when it becomes such a success, a dish, then it becomes eternally classic. And I think um, when you think of great chefs in the world, you don't really remember them for the thousands and thousands of dishes they have cooked. You only remember them for one or two dishes. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the life of chef is that we, we are very creative, we create so many things, but um, few dishes are sticking in your repertoire and people don't want you to take them away from you. And that's hard. I, I can imagine. Can, can you talk just a little bit about that creative process? When, when do you start to just understand, all right, I'm, I might be creating a new dish here. What's that like? I think, you know, every chef find inspiration through, uh, in, in the old days, we, I used to read old cookbooks. I mean, I use, I, I still, but I, I, I read less. But, uh, I, you know, I love to read old cookbook from French, uh, French cuisine. I, um, I uh, also travel. By traveling, you learn. To, by also working with other chefs, you learn techniques, you learn... Uh, you um, today, of course, you have the internet. You have Instagram, which you know there's a lot of chefs who are very creative, uh, Instam Instagramly because uh, it's you know easy access to information everywhere. But uh, and you see trends kind of going also a little bit more. Uh, but I think the creative process is something who start from an idea. And sometimes it could be, I remember, for example, the Popiette of Sea Bass that I created. Uh, it started with uh, Freddy Girardet, was a great chef in Switzerland, in Crissier, one of the greatest, they name him greatest chef in the world. And he was doing a red mullet with little zucchini scale, zucchini cut into little scale and putting the scale back over the fish, steamed the fish, and there was that beautiful fish coming with green scale on it. And it was very painstaking, uh, delicate, fine uh, work, and beautiful work. And then I worked with Paul Bocuse, and now I, I, I do a stage at Paul Bocuse before I became the chef at Le Cirque. And now I see that um, there's uh, a, a rouge, a red mullet again, with potato scales. And the little potato scales are now uh, placed very thin on the fish. And when you cook the potato on one side, uh, on the skin side of the fish and the scale, uh, by the time the potato are crispy, the fish is almost perfectly cooked. You turn over and it's placed on the on the sauce uh, of uh, made of uh, like herb blanc blanc. Uh, uh, and, and, and it was a beautiful, delicate dish, superb. And I was interested by the, the, the trend of thought and creative process around putting back the scale on the fish with a vegetable. And then I come back to New York, I'm the new chef at La Cirque, and I'm trying to think of new dishes and, and trying to bring new, new flavor, new dishes. And I still remember about that rouge with the potato scale. But you know, I'm in New York City, I'm not gonna have a cook spending hours putting little tiny scale on the feet. And I didn't want to really do that dish. But I knew that there was already, an, from an aspiration to another, and I felt like 
maybe I can keep the idea of this crispy potato with the fish, but I'm going to do it differently. So the black sea bass is a beautiful fish you can have in the um, North Atlantic coast in New England. Uh, and uh, it's a delicate fish. You don't release too much water when you cook it. And in America, you have the amazing Idaho potatoes, which are huge. You can get like them as big as a truck. I mean, it's like the, those huge potatoes. So now I, uh, I decided that, um, you know, I'm going to keep the full length of the potatoes and I'm going to make like bandlets, like long bands of thin potatoes and put them one over each other, put my fish fillet in the middle, close off my uh, side of the bandlet of potatoes and, and, and close it off. And, and I start to cook that in a pan and cook the potato on both sides very well until both sides are crispy. And because of the thickness of the fish, the fish was perfectly cooked. And, uh, and the potato was crispy and on the plate and go. So now, what kind of garnish I'm going to put with that? I want to keep it simple. So I love leeks. Leeks has a little bit of sweetness and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's sweet, it's tender, it's, it's less strong than the onion, it's, but it has that delicate flavor of onion. And um, so I made a, a fondue of leeks, beautiful green fondue of leeks, and then a red wine sauce, because I wanted a, to do a fish who could really be compatible with red wine. And uh, so that was a Barolo sauce, a great, great reduction of wine, a little bit of port wine, finished with butter, and, and so that was that very sort of reduced um, tannic a little bit and, and, and real sharp flavor of red wine with, with, the, with the fish. And so the sea bass, the crispy potatoes, the, the fondue of leeks and the red wine, and the leeks being a little sweet, the, the sauce being a little tannic and acidic, uh, that worked out so well. And the dish was an instant classic. I never changed the recipe in 36 years. Yeah, we're, we're close to lunchtime here. You're, you're making me start to salivate. When you created that dish, did you think it would live on like it has? No, but I knew that it was a smart dish. And, and uh, then following that, there were a lot of imitator, but I don't call it imitator because I was kind of imitating myself my mentor, Bocuse, on um, what he did, and, but finding a different technique, a different, a whole, and, and at the end, it was definitely tasting different and being different, but yet one thing lead to another. And I think a lot of chefs are inspired by other people's cooking, but in a very different way. They start to think left side, uh, you know, or uh, left field, and, 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 and so, you don't really recognize the dish in comparison to the one who inspire you, but there is a trend. Uh, there is a thread of thought. It's funny that thread of thought. Everything you've talked about, you can really see the culmination of your experience on the farm, learning from great mentors, pulling from other places. It's so great to hear. When you relive these moments, some of those awards, some of the great memories, what, what's that like for you? <laughs> well, I'm I'm proud for what I've achieved. I want to do so much more in my profession. I think we, uh, you know, I have, uh, I, I'm definitely uh, interested to continue to support Young Chef. It's, uh, you know, we created a foundation with Thomas Keller and Jerome Bocuse, the son of Paul Bocuse, and, and, uh, and a committee, uh, Gavin Kaysen is with us, and uh, we have a committee of about 50 uh, chefs in America of the finest chef. And it's a foundation called Mentor, uh, Mentor BKB. And it's uh, about also raising grants to be able to give the opportunity to young chef to take a sabbatical, let's say, of three months and travel the world and work in any of the greatest restaurants they dream of. And uh, we arrange everything for them. And I think that opportunity uh, I didn't have it when I was a young chef, but I would have dreamed to have it. And it's not easy for a young chef to, or a young cook to cook, to quit his job and be able to travel and come back and keep his job. So uh, that those grants really help work with the people they work with and with the, 
the the restaurant they really wish to go and work and we bridge the two and make sure that it all work and that's uh and that's so life-changing for all of them uh yesterday i did an event here with uh kristen and michael from coquette in new orleans and she gave me two letters uh kristen gave me two letters from two of our young chef and say, you know, I had one chef who already had the grant and she went to Raleigh in Copenhagen uh, as a stage. And here I have another letter from a young chef who just received a grant and she's so, so happy, she's ecstatic. And they wanted to write you a note to say thank you to you and the foundation for that. And, uh, and I was very touched because, you know, two young kids from New Orleans uh, at the restaurant Coquette, uh, I've been able to apply for these grants and, and win the grants. And so um, it's, it's really rewarding in a way what we achieve with that. And we also support the American team to the Bocus d'Or, uh, which is a competition every two years in Lyon, my hometown. And that's where uh, 24 countries compete for the gold, the silver and the bronze. And uh, about two years ago, uh, no, uh, three years ago, uh, Matt Peters, who now live in Austin and is going to open his own restaurant. And uh, five years ago, Phil Tessier, a young chef, American chef, won the silver for the first time on the podium in Lyon uh, against 24 country. And three years ago, we won gold also with Matt Peters, who now live in Austin, Texas, and will be opening his restaurant soon there. And uh, so supporting the American team to the Bocuse d'Or has been a goal also. And uh, the next one will be in 2021, in January, late January 2021 in Lyon. So look for that. We, we certainly will. We'll have all that linked up in the show notes as well. Any final advice? Maybe there's a 10, 11, 12-year-old wants to be a chef someday, that they love being in the kitchen. Any parting advice for them? Well... Uh, first, I will tell them to write, to buy my book, uh, Letter to a Young Chef. I wrote a book. Who, I've got it right over there. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Voila. So you buy the book, Letter to a Young Chef, and the second edition even, because uh, the second edition, I included a lot of American chefs to write me a small letter on subjects such as creativity, discipline, ingredients, technique and all that and because I wanted also a, a second voice to my voice as you know advising young chef uh, what to expect in this world of cooking and it's not that my advice should be the only advice but I think today there's many books who warn you well motivate you well and certainly can guide you well in this business Fantastic. Well, Chef Danielle Baloud, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Thank you, and look forward to speak to you again soon. Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you? What got